So good afternoon, uh, all of you. This is Abhishek Singh from NFSU Goa campus. So uh, in today's lecture, we'll discuss about uh, Hawaii Life Forensics and its prospects uh, in, in India. So uh, as we know that uh, India is a land renowned for its uh, diverse and uh, magnificent uh, natural heritage. And so uh, is grappling with uh, pressing issues that threatens uh, the uh, heritage that is wildlife. So uh, when we talk about wildlife forensics, so uh, first of all, we should understand the intricacies of wildlife crime. What is wildlife crime? <clears throat> So wildlife crime uh, in general encompasses illegal activities involving the exploitation of animals and plants from poaching and uh, smuggling to the trade in endangered species and their parts. So uh, in daily newspapers, you must have seen uh, the, these kind of headlines. Uh, like like in, in, this, in this headline, we, we have India sea surge in exotic wildlife smuggling or Indian women with uh, 109 live animals in their luggage are stayed at Bangkok airports. So what are they doing with, uh, with the exotic wildlife articles or the uh, whole animal part or body, body part or products? So this we need to uh, understand why, why these, these parts or the animal parts or any the entire animal is so important that uh, because of because of that, the people are committing uh, such such kind of crime, right? So uh, the the implication of uh, wildlife uh, crime in India are profound and far-reaching, uh, affecting not only the nation's uh, biodiversity uh, but also its ecosystem, uh, communities, and future generations. So uh, when, we, when we talk about wildlife crimes and the standard definition is harvesting uh, and trade contrary to the national law. So wildlife is protected internationally by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of uh, Wild Fauna and Flora, which is uh, commonly known as CITES. So uh, the cause of wildlife crime in India uh, are multi-faceted uh, and, and deeply intertwined with economic, social, and environmental factors. Uh, one of the primary uh, drivers uh, is the global demand for exotic species and uh, products. Uh, so India uh, I mean, includes iconic species of uh, India. India is a home of iconic species of uh, uh, wildlife like tigers, elephants, uh, rhinoceros and uh, makes a prime uh, target for international traffickers. So when we talk about uh, wildlife trade, so what is wildlife trade? So wildlife trade is a multi-billion dollar industry with both legal and illegal components. This industry uh, encompasses the uh, buying and selling of live animals, uh, animal products and plants. Okay, so uh, when we talk about wildlife uh, trade, so wildlife trade is a multi-billion dollar industry uh, with both uh, legal and illegal components. So this industry uh, encompasses, I mean, the uh, selling or buying of live animals, uh, animal products, or plants, or any body parts of wildlife. So uh, some of the aspects of wildlife trade are, uh, I mean, most part of the wildlife trade is illegal, but there are some aspects which are legal and regulated. Uh, so these things need to be uh, understood before we uh, uh, proceed uh, for wildlife uh, forensics. So the illegal trade is mostly uh, fueled or governed by a uh, few, few factors. Uh, that is the first factor uh, is high profit. So the exclusivity of some wildlife and their products make them uh, incredibly valuable on the black market with prices often exceeding those of the legal communities like for example pangolin so we know that uh, you know um, pangolins are not distributed in all the countries um, but they they are in high demand in southeast asian countries so because of the uh, rarity or exclusivity of uh, uh, of the pangolin species uh, 
uh the the their demand in the black market or wildlife black market is very high and that's why they fetch high profits the second factor is weak uh, law enforcement when it comes to wildlife so we due to insufficient resources uh, corruption and challenges in monitoring the uh, vast uh, wild, wildlife areas uh, makes it makes it difficult for law enforcement uh, you know to uh, protect uh, wildlife effectively and that's why uh, uh, the entire law enforcement who deals with uh, the wildlife uh, conservation they are considered weak as compared to the law enforcement which we have for human populations the third factor is uh, global demand so in international uh, market, the global demand for the exotic pets, animal trophies, traditional medicines, and luxury items derived from uh, the animal or their products are, are, are too high. Like I give you an example of pangolin. So pangolin scales are in high demand in Southeast Asian countries. So that's why the uh, demand factor is very important with, which decides uh, the, uh, the, the profit and the, uh, the, the, the exclusivity of the wildlife trade or illegal wildlife trade. Fourth point would be poverty. So in some regions like in African countries, so due to the, due to the uh, condition of poverty or limited economic opportunities, the individuals or the people there, they push themselves uh, towards engaging in wildlife crime. And the fifth point is uh, cultural belief. So uh, due to some cultural uh, belief, deep-seated cultural beliefs, uh, certain animal parts uh, are, are used in traditional medicines. And uh, because of the use of these animal parts in traditional medicines, this increases their demand so that's why you, you can you can see that um, uh, globally wildlife crime wildlife trade uh, contributes to 23 billion dollar industry which is which is uh, very high next is i mean when we talk about wildlife trade or wildlife uh, crime so what what is the uh, source uh, of of these crimes and why why people are committing such crimes. So as we discussed about the uh, traditional medicines, so in Southeast Asian countries, the uh, wildlife articles or the body parts of the wildlife or products they are in high demand because of the cultural or traditional belief that these part uh, parts of products are uh, too efficient. Uh, for 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 some specific diseases, like like some people use uh, 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 medicines, traditional medicines made from wildlife articles to treat arthritis. Okay, so some people use it to treat some bone ailments. So all these things collectively contribute to uh, co uh, collectively uh, you know uh, contribute to the uh, global wildlife crime and trade. Next is when we say about uh, illegal uh, trade. So you can see here, uh, according to the data, the most of the uh, annual illegal trade report that we have received is either from uh, uh, India, China, Southeast Asian countries, Australia, uh, USA, Canada, and some parts of Africa. So it's, it doesn't mean that uh, these countries are involved in wildlife trade. No. From these countries, we have received the illegal trade report. So this also, uh, you know, indicates the uh, efficacy of the law enforcement in these countries that they are uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, efficient and they, they know about these crimes. So, so, so they have confiscated these wildlife articles or they have, uh, they have uh, you know, identified uh, the trafficker, traffickers, wildlife traffickers, and then submitted the report. So let's see, let's have a look at uh, uh, elephant ivory uh, trade, so African elephant ivory. So you can see here that uh, the uh, green dot here is the source of 
shipment and the red dot is either a transit or a destination of shipment right so in all the, in the case of african elephant ivory india is neither a shipment or destination of shipment nor a source of shipment so india but move, move for most of the trade routes india is a transit route and that's why that's where india plays a significant role in curbing wildlife uh, trade or illegal wildlife trade so because india is one of the most important transit routes to the southeast asian countries now when we talk about african rhinoceros horns so again <laughs> as we discussed uh, the african rhinoceros horns are uh, the source of these horns are from uh these uh, african countries the south african countries and uh, the uh, destination is again the south southeast asian countries or china so uh, again you can see that uh, we, uh, we 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 have a transit route india uh, includes a few transit routes uh, of the african rhinoceros horn so again uh, in this case also india plays a significant role in curbing wildlife trade of uh, African rhinoceros horns. Next, we have pangolin scales. So nowadays, uh, you know, pangolins are the most uh, traded uh, mammalian species uh, because of their uh, thick uh, scales. So these scales are in high demand right now in Southeast Asian countries because of their uh, traditional or conventional use in, in, in medicines. So again, you can see that this is the, uh, in case of pangolins, the source of ship shipment is Africa, but in India also, we have some points because India, you know, uh, uh, includes two species of pangolin that is Chinese pangolin and Indian pangolin. So not just the transit route, India also acts as few, uh, uh, for few points, India acts as source of uh, shipment and that goes to uh, China or Southeast Asian countries. So again, for the conservation of pangolins, uh, the uh, India India plays India plays a significant role. Next, see when we say about pangolin scales. So let's let's talk uh, in numbers. So you can see here in uh, in bar uh, graph that from 2007 to 2018 we have our data. Uh, of uh, pangolin scale seizures and you can see that uh, how many number of seizures the law enforcement have confiscated and uh, how many number of whole pangolin or live pangolins have been uh, con confiscated or found. So from 2007 to 2018, the number of whole pangolin or a seizure equivalent to live pangolins uh, have increased significantly, especially after 2014. And in case of a uh, number of seizures, which increased in 2016 and 17, but in 2018, we, we saw a decline. So nowadays also, if we if you see the uh, latest uh, data of 2022 or 2021, uh, you, can, you can see that the demand of pangolin scales is continuously increasing day by day. And, and because of that, the high demand, the number of pangolin individuals, the, the number of these animals are uh, have, have significantly, uh, you know, declined. Next, uh, this is also uh, about the number of uh, pangolin scales, the volume of pangolin scales, and the reported uh, country where, where uh, the uh, origin was identified or the country where these uh, you know pangolin scales were seized so you can see that most of the countries where the pangolin scales were seized is uh, either vietnam china singapore so most of the countries are from southeast asian country uh, southeast asia so this this concludes that the demand of pangolin scales are mostly in Southeast Asian countries, which is due to their traditional use in medicines.
now you see uh, let's let's understand the uh, the mathematics behind that because you see uh, uh, when when a hunter uh, kills a pangolin or hunts a pangolin uh, or say poaches a pangolin so that cost around uh, 2.5 uh, to uh, you know 9 us dollar uh, per kg of skates so that goes to the hunter and again when the trader uh, the trader uh, earns uh, us 13 to uh, 40 us dollar per kg uh, you know by by selling those scales so the intermediary party to which the trader uh, sells those scales uh, you know gets 135 uh, us dollar uh, per per delivery that that includes around 50 kgs so this exponential increase in the cost of pangolin skills from hunter to trader then intermediary then the trafficker for the trafficker we don't have an exact data so this uh, this this uh, this creates a lucrative market you know for 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 the unemployed people of the people who are not aware of uh, these these uh, scenarios or the legality of the uh, wildlife laws so this this creates a lucrative market so it's a easy, easy way to you know get money because we know in wildlife crime the uh, laws are not that stringent as it is in human uh, as it is with human crime now uh, you can uh, see here in this uh, graph that uh, the um, the uh, most most of the this is the graph which defines the uh, you know the contribution of a country in wildlife tra trade or a country which is uh, you know indirectly responsible for the wildlife trade so uh, it it is clearly visible that most of the uh, wildlife trade has been uh, you know uh, is is uh, is routed to uh, china right so and and other countries in vietnam and uh, malaysia and democratic republic of congo so mm -hmm. these countries they have uh, so china and vietnam because of the so these two are the southeast asian countries so they have a traditional use of all the particles not just for pangolin skins the if even if you talk about uh, turtles you talk about uh, tiger uh, skin tiger claws elephant ivories so all these things are high demand in these countries and that is the reason the uh, number of wildlife crimes are day by day increasing okay so now uh, global uh, wildlife trade when we uh, say about uh, global wildlife trade so the illegal wildlife trade um, uh, of wildlife i mean uh, we we know that it's a global cri crisis that spans co uh, continents and threatens the survival of uh, several species so this illicit trade uh, involves the illegal capture killing and uh, you know trafficking of uh, wildlife uh, articles and products which is driven by uh, several factors like demand for exotic pets and as we discussed about uh, uh, for traditional medicines so uh, if we talk about asia so uh, in southeast asian countries so this region is a hot spot for the illegal wildlife trade uh, with demand for exotic pets ivory rhino horn and traditional medicines so uh, uh, but as we have discussed countries like thailand vietnam and china are uh, major hubs uh, for uh, for um, traffic Uh, but when we when we say about india so india faces challenges related to tiger poaching illegal logging and the smuggling of exotic animals but uh, india is not uh, you know directly uh, considered as the destination of the uh, wildlife trade or wildlife articles illegal trade of wildlife articles and 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 the third country which would be considered in asia is myanmar uh, which is a significant source of illegal wildlife products including pangolins and tiger parts so now let's let's come to uh, africa so uh, you see in in the previous diagram uh, which we are discussing the africa so in the south africa this region is a major hot spot for rhino 
and elephant poaching due to the demand for rhino horn and ivory. So South Africa in particular uh, uh, faces high uh, levels of rhino poaching. Whereas the, uh, the, the Central Africa, uh, in Central Africa, wildlife trafficking involves species like uh, gorillas, uh, chimpanzees, and pangolins. And the East Africa, which you can see here, two, uh, two dots in the East Africa. Uh, so I, illegal ivory uh, trade, uh, again, you know, uh, remains a significant concern uh, with uh, transit points often located in countries like uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Right. So uh, now when we talk about uh, America, you see in this one, uh, so the Latin America illegal wildlife trade includes the poaching of jaguars, turtles and exotic birds. Uh, the, the pet trade and the use of animal parts in traditional medicines are, uh, I mean, uh, very, very common there. Uh, whereas in North America, the United States and Canada are also involved in illegal trade, particularly for uh, exotic pets and uh, plant smugglings. Whereas, uh, you see, there are some, uh, some dark uh, colored areas in Europe also. So in Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe serves as a transit point for illegal wildlife trade, especially for species uh, like, you know, um, uh, caviar or sturgeon. Whereas in Western Europe, uh, the demand for exotic pets and rare plants and luxury items contribute to the illegal wildlife trade. So these things like international trade routes, the illegal wildlife trade, uh, they often operates along well-established uh, global trade route with organized crime networks uh, involved in trafficking. So, uh, and there are some online platforms also which have become a significant marketplace for illegal uh, wildlife uh, products, making uh, detection and enforcement challenging. So illegal wildlife trade involves complex and often uh, clandestine routes that span uh, uh, the, the globe. So uh, these trade routes uh, vary depending up on the type of wildlife or wildlife products being trafficked uh, to the source. So it is, it is essential to understand that illegal wildlife trade operates with, within a, a you know, a shadowy network, uh, making it challenging for law enforcement agencies to track and intercept. Okay, so we were discussing about uh, the uh, global wildlife crimes. So you can see that from 2010 to 2018, the global wildlife crime, according to the reported data, this is the previous data, current data we don't have. So according to this data, the global wildlife crime, uh, you know, till 2017 uh, has increased as compared to the previous data. So till 2017, the global wildlife crime has significantly increased. And you can see the contribution of the, uh, you know, or the involvement of the particular species of animal uh, contributing to the global wildlife crime. So you can see the maximum percentage is of elephant, and then which is 44%. Then we have pangolin, which is 20%. And then we have rhino, which is 17%, and rest other birds and reptiles and aquatic animals. So. Nowadays, uh, you see elephant, ivory, pangolin scales, and rhino horns. These three things are in high demand globally. Uh, not uh, not uh, for consumption globally, but you know somehow most of the countries are involved either directly or indirectly in the trade of these three animals and their body parts or products. So. When we say about uh, species, which are the top four species which are involved uh, uh, in trade globally? So you, you see nowadays, uh, the, the, as we discussed, uh, pangolin is one of the species. Uh, another species is elephant. Then we have tiger and then we have rhino. So pangolin is trafficked for their scales, elephant, is, is uh, you know, uh, poached for their ivories, tigers are poached for their skins, and rhinos are poached for their horns. So all these four parts or products which I discussed 
are used in traditional medicines. Now, when we talk about wildlife crime in India, so in India also you can uh, you can you can see here that uh, the wildlife crime from 2014 to 2021 has uh, you know uh, has shown a slight decline as compared to the previous year. So so let's let's talk about in general uh, when we say uh, India. So, so there is a slight decline that blue graph. But when we talk about few of the major states which are, uh, you know, which have shown involvement in wildlife crime. So not, not particularly states have shown, but in which uh, the, the most of the cases have been reported from these states. Like when we say about UP, uh, which is Uttar Pradesh, which is shown here by red uh, bar. So you can see that, uh, you know, um, they, the Uttar the number of crimes reported from UP uh, have been, you know, uh, constant. I mean, they in 2016 or 17, they have increased slightly, but then, then again, the number uh, remained uh, constant. Uh, so, so when we, and then when we say about uh, Rajasthan, so Rajasthan has shown a decrease in the number of wildlife crime cases reported. Again, I'm repeating, it's a reported wildlife crime cases. It's not, these are not the actual wildlife crime cases. So India, again, right now also is, you know, um, uh, in India, we, we see several cases of wildlife crime reported daily, but still most of the crimes were related to wildlife are not reported due to the lack of, uh, you know, awareness and uh, lack of resources. And and, uh, the, and 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 these all these things collectively contribute uh, to to the current scenario of wildlife crime in, in India. Okay, so what is that which attracts the uh, criminals? I mean, you know, uh, in in case of humans. We, we know that there are several uh, reasons and there, there could be uh, several uh, causes behind any crime. But in case of wildlife and animals, what are those uh, attractions? So first is wait for wait li uh, wildlife. So that means uh, if, so, so suppose you, you get weight by weight money. So suppose one kg of, uh, if, if you are giving a one kg of wildlife product, so you have a fixed rate for that uh, uh, wildlife products in any market, in any black market. So there is there is nothing you know uh, that uh, you will get uh, a higher amount of money at that uh, that place or that market. You will get lesser amount of money at that market. Another view for this wait for wait uh, wildlife is in case of pangolin scales. So you see uh, in, uh, in in so if a whole animal is trafficked. So the number of uh, scales would be low as compared to if you just traffic the scales, not the animals. And it's difficult to uh, traffic a live animal also. Second point is identification is complicated. So due to the lack of resources and lack of manpower, lack of trained manpower, and uh, lack of scientific methods in case of wildlife uh, investigations, the identification of wildlife uh, becomes uh, too complicated and difficult because if you're not able to identify whether the species uh, comes under Wildlife Protection Act of India uh, or not, then you won't be able to register the case. So that's why identification is very important. Third thing is conviction or penalties are, are, are too lenient in case of wildlife crime. So suppose if you are if you have committed a wildlife crime, if you have killed any animal, you will get maximum punishment for eight years, ten years. So it's not comparable to the human crime. So because of this uh, uh, leniency in the penalties or conviction in case of wildlife crime, uh, this 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 uh, you know uh, ultimately attracts the uh, criminal or or any individual to commit these crimes. And the last one is fines are often uh, disproportionately uh, less uh, than the commodity values, right? So uh, suppose if I uh, if I have a pangolin scale, as we discussed, as a hunter, if I sell a pangolin scale for nine US dollar, 
So uh, I uh, I will I will get I will get nine US dollar for a kg of pangolin scales. And for that same crime, if I have been prosecuted in the court of law, uh, probably I would be fined less than nine US dollar. So the fines are disproportionately too less as compared to the commodity value. So uh, this is right now, I believe is the major cause, the low conviction or the rate of conviction of wildlife crime, which is, uh, you know, uh, according to a report is 2%. So this is one of the major cause behind the increase of wildlife crime in India and worldwide. Okay, so now we have understood about wildlife crime, wildlife trade, what is the uh, what are the factors or reasons behind the wildlife crime? Now we'll move on to wildlife forensics. So what is wildlife forensics? So wildlife forensics aims to you know gather, analyze, and interpret evidence to assist law enforcement agencies and conservationists in identifying and prosecuting those responsible uh, for for wildlife crimes. So uh, all of you, you know, you, you must be aware about uh, forensic science. So we know that the forensic scientists, they uh, help the law enforcement agencies to, uh, you know, analyze and present uh, evidences in court of law. And this ultimately, you know, uh, affects the, uh, the, the, the result of the entire case. So likewise, for the in wildlife crime also, in cases of wildlife crime, wildlife forensics, uh, you know, uh, gathers all the evidences, analyze the uh, data from those evidences, and then interpret those evidences to assist the law enforcement agencies. But unlike human forensics, where the focus is primarily on individuals, wildlife forensics, uh, uh, you know, often deals with the uh, entire species or, or the ecosystem. Uh, they, when wildlife forensics, they do not uh, most mostly they do not deal with uh, one one animal or 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 thing or or their product. So, because we consider this uh, crime as against the nature, against the nature, against the wildlife, so that's why it's 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 different from human forensics. So, what are the major challenges in uh, tackling wildlife crime in India? So the first uh, would be human coexistence in conflict uh, with wildlife. So, uh, I mean, uh, you must have heard about uh, human wildlife conflict. Uh, so the villages which are, you know, uh, present in the vicinity of the protected areas like national parks, wildlife sanctuaries or biosphere reserves. In those areas, we have commonly seen a human, uh, these, these phenomena like human wildlife conflict. Because both humans and animals, they are fighting for the resources, they're fighting for the, the, the uh, forest resources. And, and because of the lack of uh, uh, prey species in um, uh, forest areas, the, the predators, they are compelled to move out from those protected areas. And, and in, in that course, the, uh, you know, the humans and the wildlife or the animals they, they have a conflict. So this coexistence of humans and wildlife, this causes a conflict. Okay, so this is one of the uh, major challenge and, and uh, second would be a shortage of wildlife laboratories, uh, workforce and funding. So as we know that the funding is one of the major issues when it comes to uh, crime investigation or advancement of uh, scientific uh, scientific uh, equipments. So, uh, in most of the uh, countries, there is a shortage of uh, wildlife laboratories and trained manpower in wildlife forensic cases because, uh, you know, uh, very, very few governments, they have, uh, they have focused or emphasized on the development of wildlife forensic laboratories and there is a lack of trained uh, manpower uh, in cases of wildlife uh, forensics or crime. And uh, the third one is unlicensed trade or disguised marketing and uh, prosperity charm. So as we have discussed about uh, the uh, wildlife trade, the global wildlife trade, so all these trades, most of the trades are illegal. They're not legal. 
and they use different channels different uh, uh, different channels in the black market to uh, you know traffic these wildlife articles and products so this is this is also one of the major challenge uh, you know in if in tackling the wildlife crime so uh, what are the key components of wildlife forensics so uh, there are four key components of wildlife forensics uh, that is uh, genetic analysis, morphology and anatomy, chemical analysis, and forensic entomology. Okay, so when we say about genetic analysis, so uh, you see the, the first word which comes to our mind is DNA. So nowadays DNA, application of DNA is very common in forensic investigations of forensic science. So if, if nothing is possible, if you have if you don't have any other clue, go for DNA analysis and you will get whatever you want from that. Okay, so genetic analysis is one of the uh, fundamental component of wildlife forensics because we examine the extracted DNA from various biological samples. So what what could be those biological samples? Like as we have discussed uh, discussed about pangolin uh, scales rhino horns, elephant ivories, tiger skin or leopard skin. So these biological samples, they all contain DNA. So if we, if we can extract DNA and examine these DNA, so we can identify the species also. And if possible, we can go to individual identification. Okay, so species identification is done to determine whether a confiscated item is derived from a protected species or not. So suppose if we uh, if, if the law enforcement confiscated an, uh, a wildlife article, so first thing to if is first thing to do is to identify the species. You have to identify whether that particular product belongs to a protected species or not, because only for the protected species, uh, only in the case of protected species that confiscation would be considered as illegal. If the species is not protected, then that confiscation or the article or the trade of the article would, would not be considered as illegal. So it is, it is important to identify whether the species is protected or not under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. <clears throat> Next is, if possible, go for individual identification which allows you know uh, uh, to the uh, which allows investigators or the law enforcement to track specific animals involved in the crime or trade route so genetic analysis is the fundamental component of wildlife forensics next we have chemical analysis <clears throat> so chemical analysis uh, the, the the name itself uh, suggests that it is to you know determine the chemical composition of the uh, wildlife article or wildlife products so if we can examine the chemical properties or the composition of the materials derived from wildlife uh, articles so so that uh, you know will uh, that would give us the uh, idea uh, first of all that would give, give us the idea whether that particular wildlife article is real or fake so nowadays in black market, there are a lot of fake wildlife particles which are flowing uh, from, from one country to another country, you know, you know floated from uh, Africa to China, stating that this is the actual elephant ivory. But, but when, when the experts examine that, they, 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 they find it uh, to be made up of uh, plaster of Paris and other, other materials, other synthetic materials. So examination of chemical components or chemical properties is important to establish their, uh, you know, their originality, whether they are original or fake. Because if they are fake, you cannot convict uh, a person who has been confiscated with that material. <clears throat> Next is isotope analysis, which is uh, commonly used to determine the geographic origin of the uh, wildlife products. And so uh, the, the trace elements, uh, they, uh, they can reveal about the environment where the animal live or the source of the uh, material or the origin of the material. Suppose if some uh, ivory, so if we have two ivories, one from Africa and one from uh, India, Indian elephant, one from African elephant, one from Indian elephant. So in that case, you can, you know, you can, ident you can differentiate between them uh, if, if you if you perform the trace element analysis, 
so that that might give you it's not a confirmatory test but that might give you uh, you know uh, an indication about the geographic origin of that product but if you really have to identify then you 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 uh, whether whether this uh, ivory belongs to or originated from african or uh, indian elephant you should go for genetic analysis next we have morphology and anatomy so morphology and anatomy is uh, is a kind of a preliminary analysis and commonly uh, being done since since 20 30 years or uh, or when when the wildlife forensics uh, started so you know the all the uh, items all the products uh, they have a distinct physical characteristic and structure and these characteristics and structures they they give a specific signature uh, really, uh, corresponding to the uh, species. So using these facts, physical characteristics, you can identify the species, you can identify the age and sometimes the geographic origin. So mainly, most commonly, uh, you know, uh, the, the experts encounter skulls, bone, teeth and horns uh, for morphological and anatomical analysis. But if, if you if you got the skull, you can examine the uh, species from their dental patterns also, and you can identify their age from dental pattern or from the uh, sutures present in the skull. So the uh, size and uh, shape of skull and horns can vary significantly between the species and even within the population. So therefore, you can identify not just the species, but also you can identify the population. So there is interpopulation differentiation based on morphology and anatomy of animals. Okay, so when we uh, so uh, when we say about morphology or anatomical examination, the most common sam the most commonly found sample is hair sample. So how will you identify species based on hair? So the you can in this diagram you can see that uh, you can see the cross section of hair uh, in which we have on outer layer is the scale and then we have cuticle uh, then we have cortex and then medulla so there is a distinct pattern on the scale right so this this distinct pattern is the signature of that particular species so e, most of the species have different scale patterns on their hair and if we have a database of all those species all these animals if we have a database of scale patterns hair scale patterns so we can compare the scale patterns of confiscated hair with the scale pattern of the uh, with the scale patterns present in our database and we can identify whether that particular confiscated hair belongs to uh, species a or species b so like that species identification from here, uh, you know, plays a major role in, in, in animal uh, conservation of wildlife forensics. Next is species identification from dental patterns. So you see uh, each and every animal even, uh, or, or particularly say species have, their, have distinct uh, dentition pattern. So in case of elephants, if you have elephant jaw, if you have an elephant skull, so uh, go for dentition uh, analysis, dentition pattern analysis. So in this uh, table, you can see that an upper jaw, which is ICPM, incisor, canine, premolar, and molar. So these are the number of teeth corresponding to the type of teeth. So this dental pattern or dental formula becomes the signature of elephant. So if you, you, you received a jaw or you received a skull, which is uh, which is having uh, this dental formula or this dental pattern. So based on that, you can see that this skull might belong to elephant. Next is uh, species identification from ivory. So these kind of you know uh, materials we in general we see uh, or, or the law enforcement receive uh, or the law enforcement confiscate from the traffickers. So either the ivories would be in the raw, raw form, like in the like in picture first, or they would be you know uh, polished and uh, and and carved in in, in some uh, shape or ornaments and all those things. So how will you identify based on morphology? So there is one characteristic which must be present, which is present in uh, elephant ivories, that is shrigger angles. 
right so in this diagram in this picture you can clearly see that this is a cross section of an ivory and in this cross section you can see that there is a criss cross uh, there are uh, you know uh, several criss cross lines and these criss cross lines make a distinct angle a pattern angle that is called schrager angle so this Schrager pattern is a characteristic structural feature of dentine portion of elephant tusk. So if this Schrager angle or Schrager pattern is present in a confiscated ivory, then, they, then, then this, this proves that the ivory is real, not fake. So this becomes the identification feature or identification characteristic of elephant ivory. Next is species identification from claws. So uh, the most common claws which are, you know, confiscated by law enforcement are either of leopard or tiger. So the high demand, uh, uh, so tiger claws are in high demand in black market as compared to leopards, but the most common is leopard claws. So how will we identify whether the leopard, uh, whether the claw, confiscated claw is uh, real or fake? So, uh, you know, the first thing to do is go for uh, morphometric examination, uh, take measurements, and we have few databases of uh, claw measurements uh, using which you can, you know, uh, compare uh, and, and identify whether the claw is uh, real or fake. But uh, there is one more thing. I mean, uh, you know, most of the uh, claws, uh, they have a, a remnant of bony structure at their base this this base they have a remnant of bony structure and we know that bones are prominently visible in x-rays so nobody can fake it or nobody can make a duplicate claw with that bony structure so if you take an x-ray of these claws uh, you can easily identify between uh, real and fake so fake would not give you uh, a bony uh, appearance in x-rays as uh, what the real do. So in case of real claws, you can uh, expect a bony structure at the base of the claw. So this is the identification feature for real claws. Next is pug marks. So, you know, uh, we can also identify species from uh, pug marks. So pug marks uh, uh, is a, a identification from pug marks is an age old technique, but still uh, useful uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, in the estimation of tiger population in India, uh, the scientists have, you know, extensively used uh, pug marks also to uh, identify the number of individuals specifically or the species. So you can clearly see in this picture that uh, the pug marks of uh, these animals, they have a distinct uh, pattern and based on the uh, this distinct pug mark pattern, you can identify the species. Now the next component is forensic entomology after uh, morphology and anatomy. So forensic entomology is in general is very important in case of forensic analysis, either human or animal. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, the uh, animals, the, the insects are among the first organism to colonize a decomposing carcass or a dead uh, body of uh, animals. So, so uh, if, if they first colonize, they start colonizing that body, that carcass, so they, they will start their life cycle from there. So if you, if you, you know, uh, if you can identify, if you have the knowledge of each and every stage of their life cycle, you can estimate the time of death. Uh, in fact, in fact, you can also, you know, uh, uh, you can study the insect growth rate, or, or you can study the their uh, growth stages under controlled conditions. So, uh, and based on that, you can identify the post mortem interval. Right. So, this PMI identification of post mortem interval. Uh, plays significant role uh, in, in identifying the uh, time since death. So, uh, uh, and how how long, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what was the time when the animal, you know, was poached or, or hunted or, 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 or died naturally. So, uh, because different uh, insects species, they have uh, specific uh, preferences for uh, tissues. So, that can help you in identification of either carcass now uh, 
let's let's discuss about uh, application of wildlife forensics so there are several applications of wildlife forensics but in general we will discuss about two applications that is poaching and illegal trade which is the uh, most uh, important and uh, you know uh, uh, application of wildlife forensics and second is the indirect application which is in conservation efforts so when we say about poaching and illegal trade so i mean this is the uh, we have discussed about that the the illegal trade is the trade of their products uh, or or articles of made from animal body parts and which poses a major threat to biodiversity worldwide so this illicit wildlife trade is driven by demand for exotic pets or traditional medicines or luxury items or trophies so uh, so luxury items uh, you, you see uh, because from elephant ivories or 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 uh, uh, whale ambergris, they are uh, the most demanded items or wildlife articles to make luxury items. You know, uh, so wildlife forensics, if uh, uh, you know, uh, followed properly, implemented properly, they can provide a critical leads and evidence to dismantle wildlife tra trafficking network. So, a coordinated effort uh, effort across international borders are essential to disrupt these criminal networks effectively. So, uh, that's why nowadays, you know, CITES or or uh, is uh, or uh, CITES is organizing uh, meetings uh, at at uh, several locations consecutively to to you know include all the nations and uh, coordinate. Uh, the uh, uh, enforcement of uh, wildlife laws, strict enforcement of wildlife laws to curb wildlife crime uh, and, and see the development of wildlife forensics in each and every countries. Next, we have conservation efforts. So, you know, uh, when we say that the law enforcement has confiscated wildlife articles and they produce that in court of law with evidence that, okay, this wildlife article belongs to a protected species. So that provides a valuable data and insight to support uh, the, the protection, preservation of endangered or threatened or the respective species or any protected species. So wildlife forensics uh, indirectly helps uh, conservationists to understand the extent and impact of illegal trade on wildlife population. For example, through wildlife forensics, we identified that, okay, pangolin scales are in high demand, the most traded mammal species. So this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this, this uh, indicated that uh, if the pangolins are traded in, so, uh, so, so if the pangolins are traded uh, highly, uh, the number of trade uh, ex trade confiscations or the number of confiscated seizures of pangolin scales are so high, so that would be you know indirectly affecting the population of pangolins in wild also. So this uh, you know uh, helps the conservation efforts which are being made by the conservation uh, the the agencies which are responsible or which are helping the conservation uh, of of animals. So wildlife forensics supports the conservation of uh, keystone species that play critical roles in meeting ecosystem also. So suppose if uh, why why we uh, uh, so much emphasize on the conservation of tigers because you know we consider tiger as one of the uh, keystone species. So if if the uh, if tiger uh, population declines, so that would uh, you know ultimately. Uh, uh, if affect the uh, populations of other species also, and and eventually the entire ecosystem will be disturbed. So while implementation proper implement implementation of wildlife forensics is very important, uh, you know, uh, for for these conservation efforts uh, to 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 uh, uh, to to. Uh, to conserve these protected uh, animal species or wildlife species. Next is what are the challenges in future directions? So uh, we we need to understand three things in uh, in these challenges. That the first thing is what are the challenges that we face. Second is the emerging trends in technologies, and third is the importance of international collaborations. So when we say about uh, challenges or challenged fees. 
so the first point is uh, that is uh, limited resources so we have discussed that in wildlife forensics we have or in case of wildlife per se we have limited resources and these this become this poses a threat to uh, you know um, wildlife uh, wildlife conservation or wildlife conservation effort uh, so uh, limited resources is one of the most important uh, you know challenge that we face right now so uh, this this in addressing to wildlife crime can pose a significant uh, uh, challenge so the limited resources means insufficient funding uh, manpower and technology which can hinder the uh, efforts to combat poaching illegal trade and habitat destruction so to to address this issue particularly limited resources it's crucial to uh, prioritize resource allocation uh, uh, collaboration with international organizations and raise awareness to you know garner uh, support for uh, wildlife uh, conservation uh, efforts uh, next is uh, uh, technological gaps so technological gaps in wildlife conservation are a significant concern so like uh, for example say the uh, surveillance and monitoring of wildlife so there are limited access to advanced uh, surveillance to tools like drones satellite imagery and camera traps which hinders the ability to track wildlife population and detect poaching activities so for these things you you know there are strict rules also regulations also to use drones and and you know it's not easy to get uh, satellite image images or or install camera traps inside forest areas which ultimately hinders the ability to uh, identify or track poaching activities second would be uh, the data analysis uh, part so analyzing this uh, you know vast amount of wildlife data uh, efficiently um, uh, can be a challenging task due to lack of expertise or lack of trained manpower and technology infrastructure uh, third would be uh, communication so communication gap or uh, you know in remote areas often uh, they uh, lack a reliable communication network uh, because the, the wildlife, the forest areas, they are situated uh, remotely, and there, uh, the, the, there are you know, uh, uh, the people face difficulty in in communication because of the lack of uh, communication networks, which makes it difficult for uh, conservationists to coordinate uh, efforts and um, they respond to threats in real time. Uh, fourth would be anti-poaching uh, uh, or advanced anti-poaching technologies like uh, gunshot detection system and GPS tracking for animals, which are not uh, you know easily available uh, and and leave some areas uh, vulnerable to illegal activities. So, uh, like gunshot detection, I we discussed. So it's it's very rare uh, to see that uh, law enforcement agencies use uh, advanced anti-poaching technologies to detect. Uh, gun sort uh, residues it's not available uh, with with all the law enforcement agencies and the fifth would be habitat uh, restoration so uh, when we say about technological gaps or technological solutions for habitat restorations uh, and conservation planning uh, could be you know um, uh, could more widespread to protect the uh, ecosystem effectively and so it's it's very important to you know address uh, the uh, technological uh, gaps uh, uh, in case of wildlife uh, uh, crime next is a uh, lack of uh, standardization so in wildlife crime or conservation practices uh, lack of standardization or uh, is uh, means that there is a inconsistency in the enforcement of uh, uh, law so different regions or countries you know may have varying laws or regulations regarding wildlife protection uh, leading to uneven enforcement uh, efforts like india we follow uh, uh, wildlife protection act 1972 in another country uh, uh, there, there would be different law for for same animal so this, you know, there, there is an inconsistency. Uh, this creates an inconsistency in the efforts. 
next is the uh, in case so when we say about uh, inconsistency so we should also talk about uh, uh, data so you know there are the collection of the, uh, the data the methods which they are following to collect these data they are not standardized so the parameters uh, while collecting the data they differs from country to country which uh, ultimately you know uh, uh, creates problem compiling the data and analyzing the data so next uh, point is uh, resource uh, intensive so in case of uh, wildlife as we say uh, as as we have discussed uh, resource in, availability of resource is uh, is very important or or uh, to to tackle with uh, wildlife uh, crime um, uh, cases so uh, resources uh, can be uh, surveillance or to the wildlife crime or a trade. Next is the availability of uh, manpower should be there. A proper legal process should be there. All the technological advancements, uh, you know, the the law enforcement must have those advanced technologies to deal with it. Uh, and they 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 should uh, you know deploy anti poaching units with equipped tools and trainings. Uh, and and the most important part is community engagement. So the law enforcement agency, they must engage local communities in conserving uh, in conservation efforts, which is often, you know, crucial also demands uh, resources for education, outreach and uh, development uh, programs. Next is cross border crime. So cross border crimes nowadays, uh, you know, to talk about India. So we have neighboring countries like uh, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. So Nepal and India, they have a cross boundary situation in case of elephants because elephants, they freely roam from India to Nepal. The population of elephant, a herd of elephant, you know, they, they, they freely roam from one country to another country. So it becomes uh, very difficult and challenging uh, to deal with uh, those cases because, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the animal is not restricted to the geographical or administrative boundary of a country. So before we... Uh, uh, so there is a need to uh, you know uh, uh, prioritize and form a policy in case of uh, crimes which involve cross border situations uh, next is corruption and bribery so as uh, we have discussed that wildlife is not uh, considered wildlife crimes are not considered that important so it's very really, very easy uh, for for the individuals or people to you know, uh, take uh, bribes or, or involved in corruption and all those things. Uh, next is rapid adaptation by the criminals. So criminals nowadays, they adapt uh, new technologies and, and new ways to deal, uh, you know, to tackle with law enforcement agencies. So they are always one step ahead uh, uh, from the law enforcement agencies because the law enforcement, they, they don't have that much of resource to, you know, update themselves with the advanced uh, technologies or the detection tools whereas the criminals they adapt themselves they have all the resources to uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, disguise the law enforcement agencies and the last and the most important thing uh, is the education and awareness so it is very important to aware the uh, local communities in, in each and every area about the importance of wildlife and and uh, why uh, the destruction of uh, wildlife poses a threat to their natural habitat or or or, uh, or the res resources to which although all all those local communities are indirectly or directly dependent so these challenges if uh, if we can uh, you know uh, uh, find a solution to these challenges this would be, this would create uh, this would make easy for the wildlife forensic experts to uh, deal with the crime uh, wildlife crime and uh, you know uh, prosecute uh, the uh, criminals in the court of law thank you